as usual, I have a lot of things to say and not a lot of time to say it. Um, <laughs> I'll start this morning just with, with this. As, uh, I, if some of you don't know uh, Jim and Debbie Norsworthy, uh, Debbie's father passed away this week. I just wanted to mention that um, in case you had not heard. Uh, so they're in North Carolina this morning. If you missed them this morning, that's where they're at. Um, so if you could keep them in your prayers. Um, this morning, I'm going to talk about friendship. Uh, it's probably a neglected topic, I think, in church, uh, just because I think as Christians, I think a lot of us, I think we just kind of have this feel that we got friendship all figured out, that somehow, you know, just by virtue of us being Christians, that somehow we, we know what a friendship is like. Um, I'm hoping to challenge you this morning, and, and hope, hopefully you'll find something in here this morning that I say about friendship that you've never considered before, and that this will, this will challenge your life this morning. Um, let me start by praying. God, I pray that you would just uh, open my heart this morning. God, use me. Speak through me. Uh, Lord, I pray that I would just get myself out of the way. And Lord, that uh, you would just comfort us with some words that I have to say, Lord, but also you would you'd move us, you'd change us, that we wouldn't be the same person that we came in here as. God, that there would be things that we'd look in life that, that are different as a result of your word speaking to our heart. Lord, that we would change who we are uh, as a result. I pray this in your name. Amen. Now, even though I'm talking about friendship, I have to admit I'm in that category. I do not have it all figured out. Uh, this sermon preaches well to my own soul. Uh, so just because I'm preaching on this doesn't mean I somehow figured out the formula and have it all figured out. I feel like a kid with swimmies on. I get out in the deep water, and I'm going to try to tell you about the deep water, and I myself can't even swim in the deep water. So keep that in mind as I'm preaching this. In our culture, I think you could find there is a cry for relationships. I'm going to walk you through some time here. I was born in the 70s, and I'm going to walk you through time. In the 70s, there was a show called The Brady Bunch. I bet most of you can probably still remember that theme song in your head. Here's a story of a lovely lady. This show was all about relationships. You get to the 80s. Sometimes you want to go where everybody knows your name, right? Everybody can sing that in your head. And we get to the 90s. Now, I don't approve of this show, per se, but the name speaks for itself. This was the number one show in the 90s, The Friends. It was not really a good show, but most of you probably know the theme song to that, too, unfortunately. But, and uh, now we get to the present time. that These are the shows that TV.com puts up there. There's Smallville, House, NCIS, and Lost. And out of those, I think probably Lost is probably the one that's probably the most about relationships. Uh, it's about a bunch of people stuck on an island. Um, so you can't talk about relationships if you're stuck on an island with a bunch of people. You, certainly, it's all about relationships. I think in our culture, you can see the, the blockbuster trilogy, uh, Lord of the Rings. This is one of my favorite movies. Um, there's a scene at the end of the first movie. It's kind of a very touching scene. Samwise Gimji, who's this little midget guy, he goes out and he's going to his friend in a boat and uh, he can't swim. And his friend's leaving him on the shore because he wants to go do this task all by himself. And his friend comes out and he's drowning in the water, so Frodo comes back, pulls him out, and Sam, it's a very touching moment, he says, Mr. Frodo, I made a promise to you, and I intend to keep it. And so he gets in the boat, and then uh, if you've ever watched the movie Castaway, I find this really funny. Um, the guy's stuck on an island the whole movie, and he's so desperate for a friend or a relationship, he makes a friend out of a volleyball, and he calls it Wilson. And, <laughs> and he... <laughs> It's really sad. He gets to the point in the movie, he loses his ball, and uh, he cries like a prom queen. I mean, it's just really sad. And, and you, as you're watching the movie, you kind of you feel sad for the guy because he lost his ball. And it's not even a real person, but yet you're sad that he lost his volleyball. So it speaks to the, the heart of the fact that we're, we're built for relationships. And uh, the internet, you can see it. Uh, we've got Facebook and MySpace, I like to call it my face and space book, but that's just me. Uh, there's all kinds of relationship internet sites out there. So why this cry for relationships? Why are we so wired for relationships? I think it really comes back to the fact that if you look in Genesis, it says, then God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. Notice I have us and our. If you look at it, the Godhead himself is a relationship. There's a trinity. There's, there's a relationship within the Godhead. We are made in His image. We cry for relationship. Kind of makes sense. I talked to, about this the last time I preached to you. 
that what was God doing before the creation of the world, I think this verse kind of gives us a hint of it. He says, uh, And now, Father, glorify me in your presence with the glory I had with you before the world began. What was God doing? He was experiencing perfect relationship. Perfect fellowship was in the, was in the Trinity. Now, I'm not going to explain the Trinity. It's one of these things I'm going to put on the table and back away from it. So the, another day I might be brave enough to actually make a sermon on the Trinity. But just know this. That we are built in His image and that there's a relationship. The Bible says in Ecclesiastes, two are better than one. You guys have heard the phrase, uh, many hands make light work. It's not really a scripture verse, but I think this is where it comes from. Yeah, any, anybody that's ever done anything, you know that more hands makes things easier. When Jesus sent out the disciples, what did He do? He sent them out two by two. We're more effective together in a relationship. When man created, or when God created man, he looked at us and he said, man, that guy looks pretty sorry down there by himself. And uh, he said, it is not good for man to be alone. And all God's men said, amen, right? Because that's when women got created. So this is why solitary confinement is probably one of the worst forms of punishment that you can think of. If you are built for relationships and you're put into solitary confinement, it is a troubling place to be. You should not be in isolation. You, you, you're not meant to be in isolation. So when you're put in solitary confinement, it is troubling to what it does to the mind. The Bible even speaks about the dangers of being in isolation. I want you to consider this for a minute. Peter says, Be self-controlled and alert. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around you like a roaring lion, looking for someone to devour. Now, if you've ever watched the Discovery Channel or an Animal Planet or anything those shows, I want you to think about the lion. Who, who's the first one he picks off? It's not, it's not the guy that's in the crowd with the herd or with the pack. It's always the little guy that's out away from the crowd. He's out in isolation. Consider that for a moment. The devil likes to pick off the people that put themselves on the island or isolate themselves from the pack. If you haven't been in church, if you haven't been in God's Word, if you haven't been around your Christian friends, be careful because the devil might have you just where he wants you. He might be just looking to pick you off. There was a time in the church when, when the church was exploding. And when Luke wrote this in Acts, the, the church was just literally exploding. The, the numbers were just being added. It says here, they were praising God, enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. Notice it does not say added to their number daily to those who were becoming an island. Those who were distancing himself from the church. It does not say that. When you become part of the church, you're part of the community. You're part of a family. You're not meant to be an island. You're not meant to be in isolation. Friends are unique. Now, this is a, a fun verse. A friend loves at all times, and a brother is born for adversity. Now, you guys know me. I, I have a brother, and uh, I did not put this in here to pick on him. But, but really just to say that this, that, that friends are different than your family. Their friends are different in the sense that you choose your friends and they choose you. Friends are different in the sense that when you have a family, you're born into your family. Now, you should be friends with your family. We'd like to think that we are friends with our family. But often, most of you know that you'll see your friends more than you see your family. You'll have a funeral in your, your family. And, Next thing you know, you see all your family and you think to yourself, well, where have they been all this time? You see your friends more than you see your family a lot of times. It's not necessarily a bad thing, it's just they're different. You, you, you're born into a family. You don't get to choose your family. You're, you're part of them. You're, it's just an interesting dynamic. A companion of many, or a man of many companions may come to ruin, but there is a friend who sticks closer than a brother. A companion is not a friend. A companion is like an acquaintance. It's, it's like a coworker. It's people that you just know. You, again, these are not necessarily people that you choose, but you, you're surrounded by them. So friends are different. Friends are something that you have to have in your life. The Bible says it is something that you are missing out in your life. If you do not have friends in your life, you're missing something. In Proverbs, I couldn't make up my mind which version I like best, so I put NIV and ESV in here. It says, uh, Perfume and incense bring joy to the heart, and the pleasant pleasantness of one's friend springs from his earnest counsel. Also, it says, Oil and perfume make the heart glad, and the sweetness of a friend 
comes from his earnest counsel. I like the word sweetness. I like to think about the fact that uh, you ever walk through the mall and then you, you get this, you walk near a candy shop and then you, your, your senses get alerted and you start smelling the chocolate. And there's a certain sweetness. The next thing you know, you're craving the chocolate. I think that discovery process that you kind of have when you're walking through the mall, that's kind of like friendships are. Friendships are discovered. They're not just something that just, boom, we're friends. You know, it's like, like to think on the playground, hey, Johnny and I are friends today because we said so. It's not really like that with adults. We, we kind of get to the point where we discover it. And when we discover it, it's sweet. It's something we crave. It's something we like. It's something we enjoy. And I think that's what Proverbs is talking about when it talks about friendship. C.S. Lewis has a, has a great way of describing how a friendship starts. He says, this is how the beginning of a friendship starts. What? You too? I thought I was the only one. He says, the beginning of a friendship is when you find someone who has a common passion and you discover you're not alone in it. This makes sense. Most of us can agree with this. Friends are usually people you agree with. Uh, when I was younger, I had friends that I liked to, I guess, geek out with. I liked to play video games. So we'd always geek out and play our video games. As I've gotten older, I find that my friends are more parents and they're usually just losing their mind like me. So, <laughs> but you, you share common passions, you share common interests with your friends. You, you agree with them. So if we need friendships, if friendships are very important and we need to surround ourselves with biblical friendships, what makes a good friendship? Or how do you make good friendships? Proverbs says this in 22.11. He who loves purity of heart, whose speech is gracious, will have the king as his friend. Whose speech is gracious. How many of you ever met a gracious person? There's something about people who are gracious. Their countenance is different. They're, they're attractive. In a lot of ways, they, they tend to have a lot of friends. And here's why. In Proverbs it says, Anxiety in a man's heart weighs him down, but a good word makes him glad. A friend or a person who has a good word on the, the tip of his tongue is always going to be a more attractive person. How many times, let's, let's rewind back to what I said last time, last sermon. Our, our, our words are very important. Our weapon is like a weapon. Our, our mouth is like a weapon. When we speak, we have to be very careful about our words. How we use our mouth is, is like wielding a gun around. And it says here, a good word makes him glad. Some of us just need to have a good word spoken to us. In the same way, anxiety in a man's heart weighs him down. Have, have you ever met the person who, where the, the sky has always fallen? And he says, oh, nobody likes me. Oh, everybody hates me. And, you know, you're right. You know, <laughs> kind of forced us into it. You know, this whole prophet of doom and gloom thing, you know. It, nobody wants to be around that kind of thing. You have to have a good word on your, on your heart. All right. Romans, this is how you have a good word or how you... This is how you have a good friendship. Share with God's people who are in need. Practice hospitality. Now, hospitality is not one of those things that I think always come natural. I think some people have a great gift at it. Some people have to really work at it. Uh, so I tried to think of some, some practical examples of hospitality for you. I knew a guy once that every time there was somebody new in the church, he would take them out to lunch. Now, if you're new, I'm not inviting you out to lunch. I can't afford it. But <laughs> that's an example. You're practicing hospitality. Now, if we were going to look for, I guess, a biblical example, uh, we, we could probably look at uh, not Barney Rubble, but Barnabas. If, uh, if you've read your Bible and you know anything about Barnabas, his, his name means encouragement. And there was a time in Barnabas' life when nobody wanted to have anything to do with the Apostle Paul. Can you believe it? Apostle Paul, he wrote most of the New Testament. Nobody wanted to do anything. Now, Barnabas was probably voted most huggable in his high school, and everybody liked him. And uh, when nobody took Paul, Barney said, I'll take him. And then later, when you read, Paul and the teenager, John Mark, have a disagreement. And who wants him? Guess what? Barnabas says, I'll take him. I, and I think Barney was probably one of those gracious people. I think he's one of these people, he always had a good word for people. I think he was ready to just take on people. All right, here's how you make bad ones. Uh, whoever blesses his neighbor with a loud voice 
rising early in the morning will be counted as a cursing. I, I, like, I like this verse because it makes me laugh because I have two morning people in my house and it's my oldest and my youngest. Um, and, and you know when you meet a, a morning person because they always have those cheery phrases that they say. Kind of annoying, like, rise and shine. And it's like, I want to rise and give you a left hook. I mean, <laughs> yeah, I, my, I, my wife occasionally will do this. She'll, she'll say, rise and shine. I'll say, I'll, I'll rise, but I'll leave the shine into you right now. I just need a little time to relax. Um, now, I'm, I'm not picking on you. If you're a morning person, I, really, I think what this verse is trying to say is, we just need to learn how to relate to people. You know, I, I don't think it's a, a matter of, you know, you can't be a morning person. I think part of our friendship is we need to learn how to be relating to one another. We can't always be a rise and shine type to everybody. All right, how also to make a bad one? He who walks with the wise grows wise, but a companion of fools suffers harm. Now, young people, where are young people? They're all sitting in the back, of course. That's what young people do, right? That you, this, is, this verse will get you through life. Memorize this verse. This is a very important verse. I, I've seen it happen time and time again. It's, it's, take it to the bank. If you choose the wrong friends, it will bring you to ruin. That's what this says. It also says, if you surround yourself with wise people, you become wise. Now, I know what you're thinking. My parents are living with me. They're not so smart, are they? <laughs> I've tried. I've really, <laughs> you know, Ingrid and I are doing our best. You know, that's not true. That, if anything, his wisdom has rubbed off on me. I, know, I have become wiser because of him. But take it to the bank, young people. If you follow the wrong crowd, if you pick the wrong friends, you will suffer harm. You, you know, this verse also talks about, I think, something else. Uh, Tommy and I were talking about this during, during softball during the season. You, you, some of us become Christians later in life. And you get to a point where you start to realize your, your common interest and your common things that you've had with your friends you're, aren't quite so common anymore. Uh, you might have to come to a point where you have to actually switch your friends. Um, you know, just because they, they call you up and they say, you know, hey, we're going out Friday night. You, you, you know what that usually means. I, and it, usually it'll be something like, hey, we're going to go get in a drunken frenzy and do the Macarena on Friday night. That's suffering harm. You cannot do that. You, at some point, as a Christian, you have to have better judgment. You have to realize to yourself, I may not be as close to my close friends I grew up with. That I may have to actually switch friends and have more biblical friends as I grow up. Now that I've found the Lord, I can't do those things anymore. I ha you, you have to realize suffering harm is not something you want to do. So, all right, how to make bad ones. Do not make friends with a hot-tempered man. Do not associate with one that is easily angered. What happens when you're around somebody that's angry all the time? You become angry. You're the guy that says the sky is always falling. You've got to be careful about that. A perverse man stirs up dissension. A gossip separates close friends. Or in the ESV, a dishonest man spreads strife. A whisper separates close friends. Again, it goes back to our mouth. You don't want to be caught up in this. As Christians, we cannot be in this dishonest, talk about people behind their back stuff. We're, we're, we can't be that way. Our mouth is very, we've got to guard it. It's a weapon, and we've got to be careful. We, we need to be the gracious person and have a good word, and not be the stirrer up of gossip. All right, what are the marks of a good friend? If we need a good friend, and friends are important, and we have to have them in our, in our, in our world, what are we doing? What, what, what can we tell that there's a good mark of a good friendship? Proverbs says this, Whoever covers an offense seeks love, but he who repeats a matter separates close friends. I, I don't know if there's anything more biblical that we can do than to cover an offense with loves. I, I think Jesus did that <laughs> on the cross. He covered our offenses with love. The act of reconciliation is something that we need to practice if we're going to be a good friend. Back to, this is a verse I already said, but a friend loves at all times, and a brother is born of a, for adversity. Now, this does not mean at all times, and I, we know it doesn't mean at all times, because if you look at Proverbs below there, it says, let your foot be seldom in your neighbor's house, lest he will have his fill of you, and he'll hate you. Well, what does it mean to be a friend that loves at all times? Well, that, I don't think that means literally at all times. I think it means in all kinds of times, in bad times, in normal times, and yeah, I, really, what I think it means is, is you're available to them. You're, you're, your friendship is, if it's important, then you're available to them. 
I think one of the, the best friendships, I think, that we have in, in, in the Bible is uh, that between Jonathan and David. Um, and I'll just kind of skip ahead here because we're short on time. I'm just going to read the words here that highlight it. Uh, there was a, came a point in, in, in David's life where he, his life was in danger. Saul was chasing him, and he was trying to kill him. And, and Jonathan said these words to him, I think are some of the sweetest words you'll find in the Bible. He said, he strengthened his hands in God. Strengthened his hands in God. What does that mean? I think it means this. In Galatians it says, Bear one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. There, now, I hate to keep using the Lord of Rings, but I really like that movie. In the last trilogy, in the last movie, uh, Mr. Frodo, he's got this ring, he's got to throw it in the volcano to save the world. And uh, he just, he's, he's running on fumes, and he's, he's out of strength, and he falls down, and Sam says, I can't carry the ring, but I can carry you. So he picks up Frodo, and he takes him up the mountain, and he throws his little piece of bling in the volcano, and the world is saved. Um, but I think this is what it means. I think, I think it's a great illustration of the fact that we need to be willing to share our burdens with one another. I think a lot of us as Christians, we're willing to jump right in there and, and say, yeah, I'll carry your burden, I'll carry your burden. But have you shared your burden with anybody lately? You know, I, I've, I've been struck with this a lot in my life lately, um, very personally, uh, that you'll, you'll have people that won't share their burdens with you. And what that really does in a relationship is it, is it actually creates a mistrust between you and that person. When you're sharing your burdens and they're not reciprocating and sharing their burdens back with you, you start to wonder as a friend, she's like, well, do they really trust me? I mean, that I'm not worthy enough for them to share their burdens with me? So consider that as, as a friend. If you have a burden and you're not sharing it, maybe you're on the island. Maybe you're making this fortress around you. Maybe you're just where the devil wants you. You're not meant to be an island. You're meant to share your burdens with one another. And I think too many times as Christians, we, we try to be self-confident and self-reliant and not share our burdens with one another. It's not what it was meant to be. More of that verse, uh, another thing that a friend is going to do, this is what Jonathan did. He said, he said to David, he said, You shall be king over Israel, and I shall be next to you. Saul, my father, knows this. What biblical, close Christian friends should do is remind you of the promises of God. If you have not reminded a friend of the promises that God has made for you lately, you're not being a good friend. This is what friends that are biblical do. We remind each other of the promises of God. Another mark of a good friendship in Proverbs, it says, faithful are the wounds of a friend, profuse are the kisses of an enemy. Now, this, this verse really confused me at first when I, when I read it. Um, faithful are the wounds of a friend. Wounds are not something typically we, we like. We don't want somebody to hurt us. But it says here, faithful are the wounds of a friend. This is what I believe is, is truth-telling. Uh, I think a lot of us need to have friends in our life that are willing to stand up and say to us, you're not doing something right. Now, this does not mean that we invite everybody in the world to come criticize us. It doesn't mean we invite all that into us. But it does mean this, that we should have a couple of close, personal friends that are faithful and willing to wound us when we're doing something wrong, to put us back on the right path. You know, I, I can't tell you how many times it, in my own life where I've had a friend come up and said to me, Kev, you're just doing it wrong. And I've needed that. I needed a, a close friend that was willing to wound me, to hurt me. Even though it, it hurts to tell somebody the truth sometimes, sometimes we need those wounds in our life. As opposed to the profuse are the kisses of an enemy, think of Judas, the kisses that he gave Jesus. Just not genuine, not real. I, I think in church, I think <laughs> I'm guilty of this too, we tend to play spiritual volleyball. How you doing? I'm fine. How you doing? I'm fine. Everybody's just fine. <laughs> We're just playing spiritual volleyball. I, I think what we need in church, not, not that there's anything wrong with asking how you're doing. Don't, don't go out of here thinking I'm beating you up. The, the point is, we need to have real genuine, candid discussion with each other. We need to be real with each other. It's all right to be fine, but it's not all right to act like you are and be disingenuous and not be real when, when somebody's trying to reach out and carry your burden with you. you know, I think we need to get past that. I think we can't be in isolation. One of my favorite uh, characters in the whole world 
is William Wilberforce. Uh, I think this verse kind of speaks to it. It says, oil and perfume make the heart glad, and the sweetness of a friend comes from his earnest counsel. Earnest counsel, timely advice. William Wilberforce, if you've, if you've never watched the movie Amazing Grace, he is the one that abolished slavery in England. Uh, he came to a very, a very difficult time in his life where he, he wasn't really sure what to do with himself. And uh, he got a, a letter from John Wesley. And uh, in this letter, uh, John Wesley wrote, he said, uh, just keep on doing good in the name of God. He says, one day even slavery might be even abolished here in America. And he said, if God is for you, who can be against you? And, and what, the, the thing that I'm trying to point out here is even the most, most faithful people need encouragement. Even those that seem that they are so close to God, they're so wrapped tight with God, they need encouragement. Nobody would have doubted William Wilberforce's faith. He was definitely a man that was close to God. But yet he received this letter at a time where he most desperately needed it. It took him 45 years after this letter to abolish slavery. Can you imagine sticking to any task for 45 years? He was, he was a man in this task. If you watch the movie, it's amazing. He was alone through a lot of it before he had a lot of friends to come to his rescue and help him through it. But uh, he, needed, he needed timely advice. John Wesley died six days after he sent that letter. I think it's very important that we're, we rise to the occasion and give people timely advice. Now, I, I want you to consider now the greatest friendship that you could ever have. Greater ha love has no one than this, that someone lay down his life for his friends. You are my friends if you do what I command you. No longer do I call you servants. For the servant does not know what his master is doing, but I have called you friends. For all that I have heard from my Father, I have made known to you. Now, I want you to consider this. Jesus is your friend. Now, that, this, is, this is different than any friendship that you could ever have with anybody here on earth. For one, for who he is. I want you to consider this for a moment. I've got to read this to you. More books have been written about Jesus than any other person in history. More songs have been sung about him. More paintings have been done of him. Our calendar revolves around him. Our holidays are about him. Over two billion today claim to worship him. He towers over everyone in human history. He claimed to be God. He claimed to forgive sin. He claimed to be the way to heaven. This Jesus is your friend. Consider that. Proverbs says, faithful are the wounds of a friend. Consider the wounds of Jesus. As he laid down his life for his friends, it says in John. Proverbs says, the gracious people will have the king as his friend. Think about this for a minute. You now have the ability to be the friend of the king of all kings, the king of all glory, the creator of the universe. He calls you friend. And he says, you did not choose me, but I chose you. He calls you by name. You ever run into somebody that, that you haven't seen in a while and they remember your name, but you don't remember theirs? You know, you don't want like, you don't want to get to heaven and that's the kind of thing that you have, where Jesus knows your name, but you didn't know his, you don't want to have that happen. You need to know him. You need to know who he is. He, it's already said he wants to be your friend. He's already chose you. Have you chose him? Proverbs says, but there is a friend who sticks closer to a than a brother. For he said, I will never leave you or forsake you. You have a friend that will never leave you, a friend that will always be with you. So what have we said today? We need friendships. If you do not have friendships in your life and you're living on an island, you're missing something. There's something very important about friendships that God wants us to have. We need to guard against being in isolation. We're not meant to live in a Christian bubble. Uh, we need to practice gracious words, hospitality, reconciliation, truth-telling, burden, burden sharing, timely advice and encouragement. And we need Jesus to be our friend. We need to consider having a friendship with the King of Kings. Because He's already chose us. Have we chose Him? Uh, one more thing I just want to leave with you. Uh, it's going to seem contrary to what I've just said. You know, we need friends. We need close friends. Now I'm going to tell you this. You need to be careful to who you choose your close friends with. But at the same time, consider Jesus as our model. All right? If C.S. Lewis is correct about 
we agree with our friends? How much do we agree with Jesus? How much do we share in His passions? How much do we have a friendship with Him? How much do you really know Him? Most of your friends, you know something about them. You can t probably tell me what they like to eat for breakfast or wh what they do on, a, on an average day. How much do you know about Jesus? How much do you share in common with Him? How many passions do you really share with Him? I think this is what makes church very interesting. We have a lot of friends here that we probably ordinarily wouldn't be friends with because we share the passion of Christ. Is there anything more that you could share with each other that is more life-changing than a faith in Christ? I th I, and there's one more thing. Jesus, <laughs> there's always going to be one more thing in there. <laughs> Jesus was isolated from sin, but he was never isolated from the sinner. We need to make it an intentional act to be friends with, with people who are far from God. Yes, you should choose your close friends carefully. Yes, you should have biblical friends that you take advice from and you take criticism that can wound you. But at the same time, you can't come to church and hide in your Christian bubble. Jesus was our model. He went out and spent time with people that were far from God. He was always in the company of sinners. He was always in the company of people that needed hope. How many people have you spent with in your daily week that needed hope? How many people have you turned away just because they didn't, they're not Christians? Well, I'm not saying that you're isolated, you're, you, you should just be in a Christian bubble. I, that would be the wrong message. If I, if, I, if I said that this morning, that's not what I'm saying. I do think you need close personal friendships, but I do think you also need to live like Jesus and go out and be friends with those who are far from God. There's a, there's a pastor in New Orleans called uh, Fred Luter. Um, the church was about to be shut down, and they were about to close up the doors, and he decided he was going to do something about it. And he went out and rented pay-per-view boxing and invited all the guys in the neighborhood to come over to his house. And, and through this, he, he came up with this new term, and I love it. It's frangelism. It's friendship and evangelism put together. And he started this thing, called, he coined this term called frangelism. I think this is what we need to be about as a church. We need to go out and frangelize. We need to go out and tell others about Jesus. You know? It's not so much we need to go out and join them in their sin, but to tell them that there is forgiveness of sin. You know, we need to be very careful. So, that's it for today. Have, have you... Have you been friends with the King of Kings? Have you made Jesus your friend? Has your life been different because of it? How close are you to him? Are you close like a brother? Are you close? Are you able to tell me about him? Do the words come out naturally? Or are you like, yeah, have you ever been to a Thanksgiving dinner and you've got an uncle there who probably has, he doesn't pray on a regular basis. And in fact, it's probably really hard for him to pray. And then he's asked to pray at Thanksgiving. And you can kind of see he kind of stumbles over the words as he's praying. You don't want to be that guy. You want to have a close relationship with God. You want to be close to Jesus. You want to have a friendship. So when you're asked to pray, when you're called upon, the words just flow naturally. It's easy because you're friends with him. Prayer shouldn't be hard if you're friends with Jesus. Prayer should be natural. The words should just come right out. Are you that kind of friend with Jesus? Are you missing that kind of friendship in your life? So, We're going to have an invitation this morning, and you're going to have an opportunity to come up here and to, to share with either one of the deacons or myself. And if, if you feel like you need to make a decision today, make it public, yes, I, I don't know what that friendship's like, but I want, to, I want to know more about it. This is your time to come and respond. This is your time to come up and say, well, maybe I haven't been that kind of friend. I haven't had a good word on the lips for my friends lately. I haven't been gracious. I haven't been practicing hospitality. Well, we'll pray with you about it. I haven't done it either, so I need to pray about it. So, you doors, come.